Good morning, and welcome to St. David's EC Church. Today is Sunday, November 15th. I'm Pastor Chris. I'm the Youth and Family Ministries Pastor here at St. David's, and it's my pleasure to welcome you into our YouTube service today. So you might be wondering why Pastor Pat isn't available. Well, he just asked me to take this weekend. He asked me if I was interested. I prayed about it, and I said, you definitely bet I would love to do it. Um, as some of you may have heard that our, our YouTube followers, Pastor Pat, was in the hospital. Um, he had tests done. There was no heart attack. Um, and everything with his cardiovascular system is good. The doctor said he's doing well. So praise and, and thanks of prayers to God for that. Um, many of our church members have been in and out of the hospital. So please continue to pray for them. This weekend, we're celebrating Veterans Day. Now, it used to be known as Armistice Day, but years ago, I believe it was the 70s, they changed it over to Veterans Day. I myself is, am a veteran. I've served 19 years in the, in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. And I just want to thank every veteran out there that's watching this video. Thank you for your service. Thank you for serving before me, and thank you for serving alongside me. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to serve with you. So today's message, we're going to talk about united we stand and divided we fall. So let's pray and get into this message from God's Word. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for the ability we have to reach people who not, are not in Dover, Pennsylvania, people who maybe aren't even in the United States. God, thank you for the technology you provide to us. Thank you for the things that you give us. We are so gracious, Lord. God, if you would please continue to protect all of us. And God, we are thankful for the coming of the vaccine for, the, for COVID-19. And God, may it continue to move forward. And may it be the answer that we all have been praying fervently for. God, none of us are very, very thankful to be stuck in our houses, nor are we thankful to see family members be stricken with this, with this sickness. God, I just pray for all those who right now are sick with COVID. I pray for the doctors and the nurses and the first responders who are dealing with them. And God, I just ask that they would continue to prove that the amount of deaths that we are seeing from this would, would dwindle. Lord, I know that sometimes we're not going to see the amount that are afflicted, but God, if we can save those who are dying, that is a great feat right there. And God, I thank you for that. I thank you for the men and women who have gone before and served and are serving now. It's something to lay down your life for your brother or your sister in the words of freedom. And God, thank you for this day. And please bless this message, Lord. May it reach ears and hearts far and wide. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, I invite you, if you have not visited or checked out our church website, our church website, as I get my Bible and my, my notes up here, our church website is St. David's ECC, ECC.com. Sometimes it's a it's a hard um, thing to say. It's like saying uh, a nursery rhyme five times fast, if you can do that as well. Some people are really good at that, but me, not so well at times. But we're also on Facebook. If you want to look at us on Facebook, you can find us, the St. David's um, Church of Dover. So, um, or you can look for me, Chris space C, just the letter C, and that's it. So um, if you want a friend request me, I will always be welcome to accept. I'm also on Instagram. Um, Mr. Chris 413 is my Instagram name. And so let's get into God's word today as we look. If you want to get ready, if you have your Bibles handy, go ahead and open up to the book of Galatians. We're in Galatians chapter 3 today. You know, on December 26th of 2001, I raised my right hand. And I said, 
I, Christopher Michael Cunningham, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. What a day that was when I fully enlisted in the military to serve. And to this day, when I see somebody who has a hat on as a veteran or I see someone in uniform, I try and go out of my way a little bit or just say, hey, thank you. Thank you for what you did. Because I know as a veteran, it goes a far away when I hear thanks from other people. Um, even though you'll always hear it, we don't do it for the thanks and we don't do it for the accolades and, the, and, and anything else other than we want to serve and protect others. We just want to protect our country and our government. But you know what? On September 19th of 2010, I raised my right hand again. I didn't do this to enlist in the army. I did this to enlist in God's army. Back then, what I saw was a country that was united. Okay, almost as united as 9-11 was, as we were united on 9-11, but it wasn't that close. Churches were united and people were united with pride and the desire to come together. But since then, it has seemed as though God's churches, this country, and the people that make them up have become divided. Why? Why have we come so divided from where we once were? How have we fallen so far from the mark that God has made for us? How have we allowed our churches, our nation, to become divided over something as simple as politics? You know what politics are? They're just someone's opinion of how the country should be run and the way in which it should be run. But we have allowed them to get in between longtime friendships and divide the aisle between the pews of churches across America. You see, I'm not, ta I'm not talking about St. David's specifically. I'm not talking about anyone individually specific. I have my opinion on these things and I know that you have yours. And you know, that's fine with me. But why do we allow our opinions to interject themselves in our relationships with each other? And that's what I want to talk about today. You see, because Paul wrote a letter many moons ago. And in that letter, there is one sentence that should remind us of something that we need to keep in our hearts. Now, let's look together at that chapter and those verses, Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to be in verses 15 to 29. And Paul starts out, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. And notice, the scripture doesn't say to his children as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child. And that, of course, means Christ. This is what I am trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise for if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. And so looking up at the letter, or looking at, looking at the opening of this letter that Paul writes, he opens up with, Dear brothers and sisters, now I want you to note and identify that this is a change from Galatians 1. Okay, Because in Galatians 1, 
Paul starts out. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. So now we see a change of language. It's an endearing change of the direction that he is moving towards. We're going to see a deep message right here from our brother Paul. Now that we have the law in place, we look at this agreement that occurred. And guess what? This agreement is irrevocable. No one can set aside or amend. But what agreement am I talking about? It's simple. I'm talking about the agreement between Abraham and God. Their agreement was like that of a final will. You know that piece of paper that when someone dies, it says, well, Johnny's going to get the car and Billy's going to get the financial piece and Sally's going to get the house. Okay, that's the will that I'm talking about. And when someone dies and that will is established and passed on, nobody can change that will because that's what the person said was going to happen. Now, why is this? Well, God gave promises to Abraham. Is it just Abraham or someone else included in that? Notice that, that as Paul talks further, he brings our attention to the fact that it says child, not children. So to understand this, we need to revert to Genesis 12, verse 7, where it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I will give this land to your descendants. Now, now, I know. And I was like, wait a second. It says descendants. But looking at the footnotes of this aspect of this piece, right? Descendants is actually Hebrew seed. So the word seed is not plural. It's singular, right? So I'm not an English major, but looking in that, looking at the footnotes to understand what descendants means, I'm seeing that descendants is meaning seed, Hebrew seed, and Hebrew seed is singular. So, if you're following with me, I think we know what the Hebrew seed is. Because theologians are also thinking that possibly that S or that descendants, the Hebrew seed, is Jesus Christ. <laughs> Paul then reminds us about this law that was given to Moses after the promise was given to Abraham. And Paul says that there is no way that the promise would be canceled some 430 years after it's been given. The inheritance isn't going to come through keeping the law. But why is that? Because if the inheritance came from keeping the law, then what was the purpose for the promise that's given to Abraham? Why did God need to give a promise to Abraham if we could get it by just following the law? Because when God gives a promise, God follows through. Let me say it again. When God gives a promise, God follows through. That's why, in my mind, God is the best father. I don't know what you're thinking, but I think God is the best father. And that's what I see. So let's continue to look. As we move into verse 19, it says, Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the, the mediator between God and the people. Now, a mediator is, is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. All right, so... There's this question that comes from all of this. If we weren't supposed to receive God's inheritance through all of this, then what's the purpose for the law to be given? Well, I'll tell you. The purpose was for those under the law to see their sin. Because of the law. 
But as Paul says in the second half of verse 19, the law was only designed to last until the coming of the promised child. You get it? Of the promised child. So the law was delivered to Moses through the angels, right? And Moses is only meant to be a mediator between God and his people. A mediator is only needed for the law that is given to provide and help the people to understand. But when the promise was given to Abraham, a mediator isn't needed because that promise is a gift. It's a gift. It's free. It's like, hey, I'm giving this to you. Here you go. But there's one thing you have to do. You got to have what? You got to have faith. You got to have faith in following God's God's promise, God's gift, right? You have to have faith that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, in verse 21, it says this, Is there conflict, then, between God's law and God's promise? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. So looking at Paul's letter further, the question continued. Is there conflict between God's law and God's promise? Of course not. Why would there be? The law is in place, right? The law is a check valve. How many of you out there drive a car? Now, I can't see you guys raising your hands, right? But a lot of people drive a car. A lot of people know about cars. If that check engine light comes on, that says to me, I better get my car checked out, right? If I don't know how to fix things, or if I don't fix the problem, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get any better. The problem doesn't fix itself. Isn't it the same thing with sin, though? When we sin and do wrong against God or someone else, we need to change that action and attitude because if not, things could or probably will get worse. But if you don't know Jesus and have the relationship with him that we are called to, then how can we get better? You can't fix a car if you don't read the manual, right? On how to repair the brakes or the engine or something else. So maybe you call a friend, maybe you call a mechanic. Well, guess what, guys? It's the same thing with sin. If you don't know how to fix the problem, if you don't understand what sin is, right? Read the Bible. That's why God gave it to us. It's to help us in understanding. And if you have problems with that, find someone to help you to understand it. Don't just like try and figure it out yourself. That's why we got brothers and sisters in Christ. We're here to help each other. You see, we're all prisoners of sin as we read in Romans 3.23. Because everyone is sin. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Because here's the problem. For this whole sin issue... In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me read that again. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we don't seek the help and read the manual, then how will we repair and understand what God is calling us to do? Before I really knew God, I had to seek out those who were mature in their relationship with God. So if you're, if you're seeking a relationship with God and want to ask him in your heart, I would recommend getting a mentor, someone who's older than you, someone who's more wise, someone who's been a Christian for a while, knows the Bible, right? They should be a Paul in your life. A Paul is someone who's wise, who's experienced. Even if you have a relationship with God right now and you've known God for a long time, 
you know what? It's still a good idea to have a Paul, right? And a Barnabas in your life. Someone who's like on your same peer level. Someone who is, you know, is more knowledgeable in scripture, more knowledgeable, has had a long relationship with God, more, more, more mature than you. Because when you have that, when you do that, you can keep, you can be kept accountable and accountability goes a long way. As we go further in verse 23, it says, before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were kept placed under guard by the law and we were kept in protective custody so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of the faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. So you see, now, we now have our ability to be freed of sin, thanks to Jesus. His death on the cross freed us from that, and we are no longer bound to the law, but we are now bound to the faith. We're bound to the faith that we received in Jesus. As Paul says, the Jews were protected, were in protective custody, right, through the law, but when faith was provided and revealed, we were born under the new covenant. Love God with your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, your power. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul reinstates that the law was like a guardian, right? It's like a knight in shining armor from the medieval times. But once Christ the Messiah appeared, we no longer needed that knight or guardian because now, our true protector was here. But it takes faith to believe in what Jesus provides through his death on the cross. You have to ask yourself, do I have faith in Jesus? Can I follow in the example that was set forth by him? You know what? I'll be honest with you. None of us can. But here's the important part. We need to wake up each day, every day, and keep trying, keep pushing forward. Keep trying harder and harder to be like Jesus, to be like God, right? To follow in the footsteps. Jesus was the leader. That's why he came on earth to set the example. Now we have that example to follow. So what are we doing to follow the example? Let's step forward every day, right? Put our best foot out and try our hardest. Because just like you, I need to work continuously to hit that standard that God set for us. Because guess what? Though sometimes we think, man, I can't hit the standard. God, this is way too hard. If God didn't think that you and I could do it, he would never have set that, that standard. He knows we can do it. But when we stick together and we do it together, we're stronger together. And that's when it's possible. An important aspect here is not here in Paul's letter. An important aspect here in Paul's letter is the fact that we no longer need the law because we live by faith. And that faith alone, guess what? That faith is going to set you free. But you need to have that faith and walk it daily. I tell you what I tell my teens. Don't fake the funk. We're finishing out here. Here's the last, the last section, the last piece, the last piece of Paul of, of this of this portion of the letter. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Here's the promise. Guess what? We are all children of God. We are children 
of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 27 is very important, guys. We have all, notice that word all, all of us have been united with Christ in baptism. We have all put on Christ. It's like buying a new set of clothes, right? Buying a new button-up t-shirt, right? We get that t-shirt on, we're like, man, I look so slick. I look so nice. I look so cool. I'm handsome. I'm pretty. But when we step out into the streets and people see us, they see a new us, a new you, and a new me, right? And that's what happens when we accept Jesus. We're putting on new clothes, That's what we need to do each and every day. Be excited about the fact that we get to have a relationship with God. Not many people do. Because guess what? As the scriptures say, here's the thing. We are no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Why? Because we accepted Jesus, his Father, and the Holy Spirit in our hearts, asking them to make us like new. We became one in Christ. Even though we all look different and we're all from different areas, different walks, we're all one in Christ, in God's house, in God's church, right? In our relationship with God, we're all one. Now, as we have done, we are the true children of Abraham. We are the heirs to God's promise back in Genesis 12, 7. But I want to ask you, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to continue to sin and keep walking the ways that you have been? If you're in a relationship with God already, are you going to dive deeper and go deeper with God? Or are we just going to keep on going the same way we've been? I encourage you, To stand up and say enough is enough and tell God that you are going to do better. If you don't know God yet, tell God that you're ready for him to change your heart. I did that in April of 2010. And I never thought that I would be where I've come. God's going to help you to transform your life, but you got to be committed. Don't wait until tomorrow, my friends, because guess what? Tomorrow isn't granted. Tomorrow may not come. I want you to talk to someone about what that looks like if you're interested in it, if you're interested in knowing God, if you're interested in having that relationship with God. I encourage you to seek out either Pastor Pat or myself, if you have the ability through social media, if you do not, and you have a pastor or someone in your in your life who knows the scriptures, who knows the Bible, seek them out. Talk to them about what it's like to have a relationship with God. And how do you do that? I encourage you to make that decision to change your day for a better tomorrow. All right. I thank you guys for joining us on YouTube. I thank you for taking the time to view it. I hope you have a great Sunday, and I hope you continue to walk forward and make that step to change and have a better day, a better life, a better way. Let us pray. Dear God, Lord, I thank you for this time, this ability. God, please be with us. Watch over us. Lord, thank you for all that you give us. And Lord, as we step forward, as we step forward in faith, we looked to your eyes. We look to the feet of your son and we look to your leadership. In your name we pray. Amen.